We are in Genesis 35 this morning, and if you would open your Bibles to Genesis 35, this chapter you're going to see really marks the landing strip, to use a flying analogy, a landing strip for the Jacob narratives. Uh, the narrative of Jacob's biography proper ends here. And then the next chapter, Genesis 36, is really the descendants of Esau and talking about his family line. And then chapter 37 of Genesis and the rest of Genesis is Joseph and his brothers. And so we're coming to a place that is about completion as well as correction. And Genesis 35 is filled with a number of really significant events, significant endings, as well as a few course-altering corrections. As I read the passage, you're going to hear that there are some monumental events, massive happenings in this one chapter that seem to be condensed to a very small amount of text relative to the magnificence of the events around them. And I was thinking about what kind of an analogy to make. And I think I could say, with relation to the text, the difference between the size of the events and the amount of text used to describe them is about as small as a grave is wide. Now here's what I mean by that. Regardless of how notable or magnificent a life may be, the grave will always seem quite small by comparison. No grave, however large the tombstone may be, however big the monument, is ever grand enough to signify all that that life contains and means. Now, there are three deaths recorded here in Genesis 35, but four burials, which is interesting. And the theological matrix of the narrative centers really around God bringing Jacob back to his earlier vows at the place that he had previously called Bethel, meaning house of God. So to get us started, listen to the way the narrative begins as I read Genesis 35, verses 1 through 4, as our official reading for this morning. And if you're physically able to do so, in honor of God and his word, could you stand with me for the reading of these verses? Reading from the English Standard Version. God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Put away the foreign gods that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave to Jacob all the foreign gods that they had and the rings that were in their ears. Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And may God cause his word to dwell richly in our hearts and to bear abundant fruit in our lives. You may be seated. This putting away of the idols is the first burial that we have in Genesis 35. This is when Jacob hid, that's the word used in the English Standard Version, as well as many other translations, he hid, it says, these detestable idols under the turban tree, and he was burying them. Now, I don't want you to think for a minute that he hid them in order to recover them later. This was a permanent burial. He meant to dispense with them permanently, and it was a physical way to put such pagan reliances to death, to put them out of sight. Now, we know that Rachel had stolen idols from Laban, her father. That was disclosed back in Genesis 31 when Laban searched, but he didn't know that Rachel was sitting on those idols under the saddle of her camel. And apparently, Jacob didn't know either because he swore a very rash vow that if called on that vow, it would have been 
detrimental to the whole family. But apparently, Rachel wasn't the only one in the household of Jacob that was cherishing idols. In fact, it appears now that Jacob's entire family was compromised by a sinful reliance on false gods of various kinds. And it showed up in their jewelry, in their earrings, the amulets, the bracelets. They were talismans. They were like charms that they believed would give them prosperity, success, luck, for lack of a better word. All pagan reliances, all forms of spiritual adultery that God does not allow in his presence. Now, as I read that, it may not have any apparent relevance to us personally, but oh, let's not move past it that quickly. I hope you know, and I think most of you do realize that this is not just a problem in Jacob's family. We deal with this at various levels every day of our lives. This is a real and present danger for all of us. I see it in my life, the constant, subtle pull toward a form of idolatry. For all believers, we must put to death anything that rivals our trust in the Lord or our allegiance to Him. Sometimes even a good thing that is not intrinsically bad, not necessarily sinful in and of itself, can become a bad thing if it takes an inordinate amount of our attention or time or affection. It then borders into the zone of idolatry. Things like a career. Nothing wrong with a career. Many good things about that, but it can become an idol if put out of its proper place. Or money or sports, or entertainment, and the list goes on. The rivals for our time and allegiance are everywhere. Now, verse 4 records that these graven idols, in this case, were handed over to Jacob, and he buried them under the terebinth tree that was near Shechem. And I think that's an interesting phrase at the end of verse 4. The mention of this terebinth tree using a definite article, the terebinth tree, as if it is noteworthy as a, a tree of importance during the time when Moses recorded this. The New American Standard Bible calls it the oak. At any rate, God had clearly spoken to Jacob, and he's now advancing forward in obedience with this burial of the idols. God's word to Jacob has always been very clear. God has never muddied things through miscommunication. It is Jacob and those other saints who have heard the commands where the failure has always happened. It's never been on God's end. He has always been very clear. Jacob knew that he must dwell at Bethel, and there he must make an altar. He made that vow decades earlier at the first appearing at Bethel. So God sends him on his way, and Jacob is in the process of obeying now. The man is on the right path. He is doing what God had told him to do, and God protects this family as they sojourn through hostile territory in obedience to God. Now look at verses 5 through 8. And as they journeyed, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. And Jacob came to Luz, that is Bethel, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar and called the place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. Now it had been about 30 years, three decades, since Jacob saw the vision of the ladder ascending into heaven at Bethel. Jacob there made a vow, and God made promises, but Jacob has not kept his end of the bargain. He has not fulfilled his vow yet. Oh, he came close. He made strides, but he had not returned to that place until now. Uh, in the last message, when we considered chapter 33 and 34, you know, Jacob settled in Shechem for about 10 years. That's Genesis 33, 34. He was only about 30 miles from Bethel. He stopped 30 miles short of obedience in settling in Shechem. Uh, 
and it was a costly mistake. With a house full of idolatry to all kinds of pagan false deities and a place they were not supposed to settle, surrounded by pagan influences, Jacob and his children lost so much at Shechem. 30 miles from where he was called to return 30 years earlier. And so the first burial in this chapter is the burial of the pagan idols under the terebinth tree. And now we have the first completion, so to speak, in verse 6, where Jacob completes his vow. He finally fulfills the vow by coming back to Bethel. And we can also add that in keeping the vow, he submits to the first correction recorded in Genesis 35. He has corrected the lack of obedience. And as a symbol of his faith, Jacob, we are told, built an altar, and he reaffirmed the place and called the name El Bethel, the house of God. Completion and correction. Then, without any apparent warning, Rebekah's nurse, Deborah, died. Look at verse 8. And Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died. And she was buried under an oak below Bethel, so he called its name Elan Bakuth. So Deborah died, and they buried this senior saint woman under an oak just south of Bethel. And that became the oak of weeping. Now, the death of Deborah seems disjointed, doesn't it? From the context, it seems to be a non sequitur from what comes immediately before it and what comes immediately after it. It seems to interrupt the Bethel narrative. And what we have here is that in verse 9, God appears to Jacob again and blesses him. So right before that is the blessing and the call to Bethel, then the death of Deborah in verse 8, and then verse 9 is back to the scene about Bethel. And it's a sudden transition, and you know what I believe is represented in the literary flow that Moses is giving in this book? I believe this is the way death comes in life. You're in the middle of doing other things. You're in the middle of going about the other commitments and the vows that you have in life, and suddenly, sometimes without warning, death comes. It just comes. Just like death in our families, it comes into our lives sometimes as a jarring, unwelcome surprise. And so here we have the first physical death in this chapter, but the second burial following the burial of the pagan idols. And this is also another completion, because it's the completion of Deborah's 180 years of life, spanning the lives of three patriarchs. Think of it. Going back to the time of Abraham, through the life of Isaac, and now into the life of Jacob. And her role as a beloved member of Jacob's house since before he was born, it all comes down to this. Now, Deborah, if you read the narrative going back in Genesis, Deborah originally came along with Rebekah when Isaac got Rebekah from Abraham's kin in Upper Mesopotamia. And so she was part of the entourage going back with Rebecca. And it's likely that she had been brought along from Hebron after the death of Rebecca. And Rebecca died while Jacob was serving with Laban. And so after Rebecca's death, Deborah must have joined Jacob's entourage as they sojourned back to Bethel. That would be one explanation, though. I'm speculating somewhat in saying that. That's one way to think of why she's with the family now. And so Jacob was finally in the right place. He's making needed corrections in his walk with the Lord. He's telling his family, put these idols to death, bury them, change your garments, and suddenly, in the path of obedience, death occurs. And we cannot read judgment into that. We cannot think that because someone dies, someone that we love dies, to think, God must be judging me. No. That there's not a one-to-one -one correlation between the fact that we may deserve judgment and the fact that someone dies. That's simply not the way it is. Ever since the fall, recorded in Genesis 3, all creation is under the curse of sin. As the scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. 
but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so one of the lessons that we can learn from Deborah's death here is that following the Lord in faithfulness doesn't exempt us from the necessary sorrows of life. We must all deal with death. But some deaths are more consequential to us than others. And it's a different kind of grief than what they experienced back in Genesis 34. If you remember last Sunday's message, there was a lot of grief in Genesis 33 and 34 after being defiled with the worldliness of Shechem and then using the Old Testament covenant sign of circumcision as a ruse to slaughter their neighbor. Now Jacob's expression of grief is reflected here in the naming of the place, Alon Bakuth, which means the oak of weeping. And we learn here that following the Lord in faithfulness does not exempt us from the necessary sorrows of life, even as we hope in the Lord. And so Jacob buries Deborah there, and it's another element of completion of the generation that is passing off the scene. And then the narrative returns to God's reaffirmation of his promise to Jacob, now called Israel. Look at verse 9 and following. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Aram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. In these verses, the covenant promises are reaffirmed. And this is a parallel account to God's promises to Abram, going back to Genesis 17. And if you recall, back in the narratives with Abraham, a long time ago in the study, but God had given very similar promises to Abram, and we have a lot of parallels here. Abram's name was changed to Abraham, for one, that's a sign that the promise would be fulfilled, but there are other parallels between Genesis 17 and Genesis 35 that I think are striking in their similarity. And I wanted to give these to you briefly. First, there's the change of name in both instances, Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel. And then the second parallel is the first use of the divine name El Shaddai is in Genesis 17, and the next time is here, Genesis 35, El Shaddai. Third, the promise is given to Jacob parallel, the same promise is given by God to Abraham back in Genesis 17. And fourth, when it's over, El Shaddai departs from Jacob using the same descriptive language as when he departed from Abraham in Genesis 17. A clear parallel. And so here, God reaffirms that Jacob is now named Israel. And a company of nations will come from him. Kings and kingdoms will descend from him in the land of promise. Now, Jacob is a man who was beset with fears and anxiety. I think that's one of his, his common personality traits. He's always worried. He is constantly fretting, and that yields to his constant planning and calculating and coming up with deceptive ways to protect himself, that becomes his besetting pattern. I believe that God is giving Jacob these promises preemptively long before he would see a fulfillment. He's given them to comfort him. I believe he wanted Jacob to be comforted by these promises. That was the obvious intent of God. And one of the applications I can say to us is that when received with genuine faith, the promises of God for us that apply to us are as prized as the fulfillment. 
That means we can be as happy about the promise that God has made that applies to us as if it was already fulfilled. Now that is the work of faith. The flesh doesn't do that. The flesh would only delight in what it sees and feels with the empirical senses. It only wants that substance. But remember what Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the substance of things not seen. It is the evidence of things not seen. So faith apprehends and lays hold of those things and says, I will praise you now for that which you have promised, even though I haven't held it, even though I haven't seen it with my eyes. And when God tells us that something is true about a fulfillment in the future, you can count on it. He wants us to be comforted by it. He wants us to rejoice in Him now and to praise Him now because His promises are all guaranteed and it's only a matter of time. And so Jacob, now called Israel, sets up a pillar and he pours out a drink offering with oil on it and he reaffirms the name of the place as Bethel, meaning the house of God. But this time, now this is different from Genesis 28, this time he invests it with new meaning because now it's personal. Now it's much deeper to him after all these years of wandering and going off track and getting back on the track. A new man named Israel is now rising from this encounter with God at Bethel. This is like a one-man revival. He renews his trust in God here. Now the covenant promises have been reaffirmed and Jacob moves forward as a renamed man and he leaves Bethel. Now here's where the narrative changes. Verse 16 continues. Then they journeyed from Bethel when there was still some dif distance from Ephrath. Rachel went into labor and she had hard labor. And when her labor was at its hardest, the midwife said to her, do not fear for you have another son. And as her soul was departing, for she was dying, she called his name Benoni, but his father called him Benjamin. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. Now let's pause here before we go immediately to verse 20, which completes the thought. I want to do something that we would have a tendency to do naturally because of the magnitude of the grief in the loss of Rachel, but I want to first acknowledge the tremendous answer to Rachel's prayer in the conception and birth of another son. This conception and birth was no doubt attended with great joy by Rachel and Jacob when they knew that they are expecting another child. This is an answer to prayer. The conception of this second son for Rachel was surely a joy to her and surely a joy to Jacob. We would rush right past that. And I think we would miss something of the dynamic of what's going on here in the sadness compared to the joy of expectation. It was, after all, the answer to their prayers. When they named their first son, her first son, Joseph, it means, may he add. That's a prayer to God. May God add. We want more children like Joseph. And God has answered that prayer. This child is the only son of Jacob to be born in the land of promise. That's distinct. None of the other sons were born in the promised land except this child. And what a joyful prospect that is. So this is Rachel's second son. This twelfth son of Jacob is the completion now of the twelve tribes of Israel. So here, in this one section, we have two completions. And you can see them. There is, first of all, the joyful completion of the twelve tribes of Israel. But then the sad tragic and unexpected completion of the life of Rachel. And so here we have an unexpected completion. When intense labor pains came upon Rachel, what happened next was not accept, expected by any humans, only by God. Only God knew that this was in the script. Rachel is giving birth Everyone expects her to have the baby, to nurse the baby, and they would later circumcise the baby and dedicate him to the Lord, and she would raise him. 
and all the natural expectations, but she died. She died before those other expectations could be realized. The baby was born at the same time as her life ended. And there was nothing that Jacob could do to keep Rachel from dying on that significant day or at that particular hour. And if he could have done something, he would have done it. He would have done anything to keep her from dying. And you know, there's a, a painful irony here in this narrative that goes back to what Rachel earlier said to Jacob in Genesis 30 when her sister Leah was having all these children back to back and she remained childish. Remember what Rachel said at the beginning of Genesis 30? She said to Jacob, give me children or I die. How ironic that in answering that prayer, it became the means of her death. It is so hard to stand over the bed of someone you love dearly as they breathe their last, knowing there is nothing you can do to stop it. Even for believers, even when the death is foreseen, it can be very painful. About 30 years before this, Jacob thought death was coming for a lot of the family when they were about to confront Esau. You remember that scene? Jacob tried to arrange things in the family to prevent Rachel from being killed at the meeting with Esau. And he placed Rachel behind Leah and all the other members of the family. She was protected because she and Joseph were valued and loved, while the others, not so much. And they saw that, and they resented it, as you would expect. So if Jacob was planning the script, he would have said, Leah dies first, Rachel dies last. But God wrote the death of Rachel first and the death of Leah last. And that's the arrangement of mortality. And you and I have no say. Neither Jacob nor we can do a thing to alter God's timing. But herein is comfort for us as believers. And I have drawn great comfort from the words of David in Psalm 139, 16. So many saints have drawn comfort from what King David writes, where he says of Yahweh, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. That is true. Our days, and we could add our hours, our minutes, are all known to God. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't fight death when we see it coming. It doesn't mean we shouldn't get treatment, that we shouldn't do everything we can to save a person's life. But God already knows all of those things. And all of those things are already calculated in the providence of His will. And He has a day. He has an hour and a minute when death will come. Now, it's not expected that a young pregnant woman would die while in labor, and it's far less common now than it used to be in times past, but the expectation is that the new mother is going to live to raise her new baby to adulthood and maybe to dance at his wedding, so to speak. But for reasons that are inexplicable to us, God has a good plan and a purpose for the timing of every birth and every death in the progress of his will. And this truth is freighted with gravity and substance for me as I say this. But it is for us as believers to trust in God and in his good purpose, even when it doesn't make sense. Now this scene reminds us also that out of death comes life. It's true in the immediate context of Rachel dying and giving birth to Benjamin, but it's ultimately true, of course, in our spiritual life and how it only comes through Christ's death and resurrection in our place. We receive life through the free gift of faith. And as the Gaither hymn says, because he lives, we can face tomorrow, but our hope must be in Christ and him alone. 
Now, just before Rachel's unexpected death during labor, she was told by the midwife that her second child is another son. I think it was perhaps hoped that this news would strengthen her and maybe cause her to rally. But she was about to die, and she realized it. Before she died, Rachel named her child Ben-Oni, which means son of my sorrow. And if it was said in the plural in Hebrew, it would have been Ben-Onim, ending with an I-M, son of my sorrows, and that would have the consonant sound that would parallel Jacob's renaming Ben-Yamin later, that you'll see that, but just make that note. Now, this name, Ben-Oni, in the singular, reflects Rachel's grief of dying on the same day that God is answering her prayer. God answered her prayer for another son, but ah, she doesn't get to raise the son, and it all coalesces in the naming here. Now, in the Hebrew culture, the naming of a child is often a snapshot of what the parents are feeling or hoping at the moment of birth. And in this case, the name is a reflection of Rachel's pain and her suffering physically as well as emotionally in having this child that she's not going to get to raise. She wouldn't even get to nurse her baby. And she is in sorrow. However, Jacob, knowing the power of a name, Jacob hears what she says, and he wants to honor what she's saying, but he takes the syllables and he changes them around to say Benjamin, Benjamin in Hebrew, which means son of the right or son of my right hand. It's the, the hand of strength and dexterity and dominance for about 90% of the population. And this name would be a tribute to Rachel, and what she intended, but it would also and primarily be a tribute to God and what God had done in granting 12 sons and completing the 12 tribes of Israel. This child would grow to represent strength and skill in the family of Jacob as God advances his will through them. And so Jacob transposed the name from a minor key of sorrow and into a major key that signifies strength. Verse 19 and following, hear it again in the context. So Rachel died, and she was buried on the way to Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. And Jacob set up a pillar over her tomb. It is the pillar of Rachel's tomb, which is there to this day. Israel journeyed on and pitched his tent beyond the Tower of Eder. And so this marks the third burial so far in Genesis 35, with the burial of the idols, then the burial of Deborah, and now of Rachel and it's the second pillar that Jacob sets up, one at Bethel in verse 14, and now here in verse 20 to mark the grave of his beloved Rachel. So as of verse 21, the family of Jacob, they are staying beyond what is called the Tower of Eder, E-D-E-R. And that is near Bethlehem, and it says they pitch their tents. And it seems all pastoral, and placid and quiet. They're pitching their tents. And then another jarring transition. Verse 22. While Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. Now what is going on here? I want to explain this verse in a family-friendly way. But those of you who are mature, you're going to know that there is content going on here that you need to understand biblically. What Reuben, the eldest son, the eldest child, he is the prototokos of the family, the firstborn, the, the preeminent one, the one who would inherit the majority share of the birthright and the blessing typically, what Reuben did with Bilhah, who was originally the servant of Rachel and became the concubine because Rachel gave Bilhah to Jacob to produce children, that's how it all happened. So now she is called the concubine of Jacob. What Reuben did was not what we would call a, a moment of passion. It, it was not lust out of control, like something that he just suddenly did spontaneously. Spontaneously. 
No, this was worse than that. Reuben's sin was a calculated, premeditated plan to usurp his father's pattern to place all things concerning Rachel and her precious children above all the other members of the family. Reuben knew that that was going to happen. He knew that when Rachel dies, Leah is going to be passed up again. Now, Leah is Reuben's mother, and he wants to protect his mama. And so when he sees, he knows that Jacob, the wheels are turning, Rachel dies, the concubine associated with Rachel, she's going to be passed over Leah in the line of succession. And he says she's going to be the, the new right-hand woman, and he sees it coming. So this is a move to cut that pattern off. He is trying to break the line of succession, and so he seduces her. He deflowers her to cut her off in the line of favoritism so she won't be promoted after Rachel's death above their neglected mother, Leah. That's what's going on. Now, that was a familial power play because Reuben knew that Jacob had his obvious favorites. Everybody in the family knew that. Bilhah would then be in the status of a living widow. And it was customary to believe that strength and power was passed down to the one who took the concubines of another man. And this happened even later in the history of Israel. Many, many years later, this is the same thing that happened with King David and his concubines when David's rebellious son Absalom defiled the king's concubines on the roof of the palace under a tent with all of Israel knowing about it. That's recorded in 2 Samuel 15 and 16. That was another cultural power play to obtain dominance within a family of power or over the head of a dynasty. So Reuben cut that off. Now Jacob knew about this, of course, and he was angered about this sin of Reuben until the day of his death. He never got over what Reuben did. In fact, if you uh, fast forward to the deathbed scene of Jacob's life in Genesis 49, he says of Reuben, when he's giving a blessing and the curses to all of his children, he says to Reuben in verse 3, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the firstfruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity and prominent in power, unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. And in these words, we hear a sharp yet needed word of correction to an older son who sinned greatly and at great cost to the entire family. Be sure your sin will find you out. And this was a premeditated plan that backfired big time. And then the scene changes again. In verses 23 to 26, the names of Jacob's sons are given, not necessarily in the order of age, although there's a little bit of that with Reuben being the firstborn, but it's really given in maternal order. So it's stated in the order of who gave birth to the sons, beginning with Leah, the most prolific bearer of children. So there's a maternal listing of the children. And then finally, we have another death. A third death and a fourth burial recorded the death of the second patriarch, Isaac, in verses 27 to 29, where it says, And Jacob came to his father Isaac at Mamre, or Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, where Abraham and Isaac had sojourned. Now the days of Isaac were 180 years, and Isaac breathed his last. And he died and was gathered to his people, old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. Now, I think that's an interesting fact there at the end. That last fact about Esau and Jacob reuniting to bury their father reflects a reality that death forces the living, even in divided families, to come together at a funeral. And you see this a lot of times when somebody dies, all the different sides of the family show up. And Sometimes it's a very different 
group. I mean, you see a lot of different flavors and sides and mixes together. Beliefs are different. And they all come together at death. Now, that's not exactly what we have here. Because the two divided but now reconciled, because they have reconciled, these sons of Isaac, they come together again, this time to bury Isaac. Old laughter has died. And now it's, it's interesting that we're told here by Moses that Isaac breathed his last, but he didn't actually die here. I mean, he didn't die in this time period. We're surprised, I think, to find the death of Isaac in Genesis 35. Isaac actually dies later on. He dies about 12 years after Joseph is sold into slavery in Egypt. But what Moses, as the author, is doing is he's observing not so much a chronological retelling as a literary emphasis. And he puts the death of Isaac here in chapter 35 with all these other deaths because it closes off that generation. And he's recording the, the conclusion of a generation so that after he gives the, the narrative about the descendants of Esau in chapter 36, he can go in chapter 37, what we call chapter 37, though they didn't have chapters back then. The rest of Genesis is about Joseph and his brothers. And it explains how they got down to Egypt. And that had great significance for the people to whom Moses was originally writing. They were just uh, exiled and sent out from Egypt. They are now in the Exodus. They are wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and so Moses is giving them the official divine telling of their history as a people. And so that goes with the death of Isaac. There's a lot of completion and correction woven through Genesis 35, but now the narrative of God's redeeming grace shifts from Jacob to Joseph and his brothers, and this serves to explain how Israel got down to Egypt and how their slavery came after a rapid descent from one of their own being the second in command. So what is there in this chapter for us? What we learn from this chapter is that God is always calling us, like Jacob, to a renewal of our faith in a closer walk with him through all the joys and sadnesses of life. There is life that can only come through death. And each end has a new beginning, if submitted to God in faith. It's all part of God's plan for completion and correction for us. Let's pray together. Father, our times are in your sovereign hands. When death comes with alarming suddenness or with painful slowness, we rest our hearts in the fact that you control all times and all seasons and that our days are indeed recorded in your book before one of them came to be. And for those who are grieving here among us or watching online, we do ask for your comfort and for your peace. I pray that we could surround them somehow with your love and with our support in various ways according to the present needs of the moment. May we walk in a renewal of our faith, keeping our vows and commitments as Jacob does here, even at great cost, and to do so for the glory of your name and for the eternal benefit of our own souls. And we pray all these things for Jesus' sake. Amen.